It's election time in the U.S., and no matter what news source you follow, you can find an overwhelming sense that people are unhappy about it. There are lots of reasons you could attribute to this trend of unhappiness, but in this series, we're going to take a look at how the ways people decide to vote impacts their satisfaction with the outcome. Since this is a physics programming channel, we're going to study this question using a computer model. This model we'll be using makes a few assumptions. First, it assumes that each voter takes a stance on each of a set of issues. For example, let's suppose a country with limited land mass is facing the question of how to best organize citrus trees on a farm. Although in the real world, political opinions about such a subject can take a variety of forms, for now we'll make the simplifying assumption that each stance is represented as a positive one and a negative one, such as, do you think it should be legal to grow lemons and oranges in the same grove? And the stance is a simple yes or no. Second, this model assumes that each voter prioritizes these stances differently, meaning issue 1 might be more important than issue 2 to voter A, but voter B might consider issue 2 more important than issue 1. Third, it assumes that a voter is going to vote for a candidate whose stances on the set of issues most closely matches the voters, as weighted by their priority. So, for example, suppose candidate Bob has the same stance as voter 1 on every issue except number 4, and candidate Jim has the same stance as voter 1 on issue 4 and no other issues. If voter 1 places a much heavier priority on issue 4 than on issues 1 through 3, voter 1 is going to vote for candidate Jim even though he only agrees with him on a fraction of the issues. This brings us to the main calculation of this model, vote selection. Each voter's stance on each issue is compared with each candidate's stance on each issue, resulting in a match score. If the voter agrees with a candidate on an issue, the score increases by the amount of priority the voter has assigned to that issue. Whichever candidate has the highest match score for a voter wins that voter's vote, and the code moves on to the next voter. But the model doesn't just throw away that match score. Since that match score is weighted by priority, it represents how satisfied that voter is with each candidate. So the model also keeps track of each candidate's total match score as a measure of the population's satisfaction with that candidate. Over the next six weeks, we're going to look at various voting scenarios and decision-making schemes. But first, let's go over a few ground rules. Number one, no real-world parties, candidates, or issues will be named in this series. As a corollary, if you see any political ads before or during these videos, please let me know so that I can ask YouTube to remove them. Number two, numbers assigned in the computational model are strictly for computational purposes. There is no moral or ideological meaning assigned to positive numbers versus negative numbers or to smaller numbers versus larger numbers. 3. This is a model that reports averages and is not meant to embody any particular voter's experience. If you feel that your perspective on voting is unrepresented, download the code, adjust it to match your view, and post a reply video discussing the results. Number 4. Finally, this code and the results presented are being conducted by me without any support from, influence from, or deference to any educational, civic, political, or religious institutions I am currently associated with or have previously been associated with. With that covered, let's take a look at the code itself. First, we have a set of issues on which each voter and candidate adopts a stance and assigns a priority. Second, we have an issue generator. It selects a random stance for each voter weighted by that voter's political leaning. If a voter's political leaning is equal to positive 1, then it selects positive 1 as every stance. And if a voter's political leaning is negative 1, it selects negative 1 as every stance. If a voter's political leaning is zero, then approximately half their stances are positive one and half their stances are negative one. Political leanings that fall in between those extremes produce more or less positive or negative stances, respectively. This generator also randomly assigns a voter's priority to each issue as a value between zero and one, but we'll take a look at that more closely in a future video. Next we have the voter who has a name and a set of issues generated by the generating subroutine that we saw earlier. They also have a vote where we keep record of which candidate they have voted for. The candidate is set up much the same way as the voter uh, in that their stances are assigned based on their leaning. They also have these additional records including the number of votes they've accumulated, the number of times they've won, and the population's satisfaction with them. So that takes care of all the definitions we need to establish. The first actual step in the code is to generate the set of candidates and then the set of voters. Note that each candidate has a fixed political leaning, while the voters' political leanings are randomized each year. 
The code loops over a number of election years to calculate an average of the results since we're dealing with random variables. The next block is where the code generates the voters whose leanings are randomly generated every election cycle. The next block is essentially the most important part of the code, where the voters evaluate each of the candidates. The match score calculation that we talked about takes place in this line here, where if the voter's stance on an issue is equal to the candidate's stance on an issue, then that amount gets added to the, uh, to the voter's match score based on the priority that they've assigned to that issue. After examining all the candidates, the voter's vote is assigned to the candidate with the highest score, and that candidate's number of votes increases by one. We also add the match score to that candidate's population satisfaction so that we can keep a record of how satisfied all the voters are with the eventual winner. After all the voters have assigned their votes, the winner is determined by comparing each candidate's number of votes, and that candidate's number of wins increases by one, so that we can compare the candidate's number of wins over the course of many years. But we're not just interested in who won each election. We'd also like to examine how satisfied the population is with the winner each year. So we take the winner's population satisfaction and add it to this average satisfaction here. Finally, we plot a set of data points representing each voter's satisfaction with the winner versus the voter's political leaning. Doing so will help us evaluate the question of whether voters with extreme leanings or voters with moderate leanings tend to be more or less satisfied with the outcome of an election. So let's see what happens in our simulated elections. As a reminder, we've got five candidates, two extreme candidates, Bob and Jim, who are each going to take positive one or negative one stance on each issue, Tom in the middle, who is going to take 50% positive ones and 50% negative ones, Sue, who is going to take more positive ones than negative ones, but not necessarily all positive ones, and Deb, who is going to take mostly negative ones, but some positive ones. So if we run the simulation, we're simulating 50 election cycles, and what we see is that Bob and Jim, our two extreme candidates, win all of the elections, while our middle-of-the-road candidates win exactly zero elections. But what's additionally interesting is that the average satisfaction of these winners is about 25 to 26% with a standard deviation of only one and a quarter percentage or one and a third percentage. If we take a look at the graph, we can see where this uh, low satisfaction rate comes from. The Again, this is a graph of the uh, satisfaction with the winner versus each voter's political leaning. We see that the folks at the extremes are either relatively happy with the candidate or they're extremely displeased with the candidate, such that if you take the average of this cluster and the average of this cluster, it's right around 25%. Meanwhile, the middle of the road voters are marginally happy with each of the wins. There's, their block here is much more tightly clustered, but it's tightly clustered around this 25%. So the total average for the population comes out to around 25%. So why is it that Tom, Sue, and Deb don't win any of the elections? Well, remember that while each voter has a slightly different political leaning, either in the positive or negative direction, this only sways how they randomly select their stances, but doesn't guarantee which issues they'll take a positive or negative stance on. So even if a candidate had a leaning of 0.5 like Sue here, they determined that Sue is not a good match for them based on the fact that Sue randomly selected different positives and negative, positive ones and negative ones than the voter did. So even if a candidate had a leaning of 0.5, the same as Sue's, if they select a different issue than Sue to take a positive one stance on, they determine that Sue is not a good match for them. So the candidates that have the extreme values of political leaning are more likely to catch more partial matches. We can see this effect continue if we remove Bob and Jim from the list of candidates. So let's comment out Bob. Let's comment out Jim. Now our candidates with slight political leanings take most of the wins, while Tom, our true middle-of-the-road candidate, only takes a fraction of the win. By the way, you'll notice that the average hasn't changed much. It's still right around 25-26%, and the shape of the graph is not terribly different. Uh, we can also see this continue if we reintroduce one of the extreme candidates. If we put Bob back in, we see that Bob wins most of the time, with the rest of the wins going to Deb, the candidate with the strongest leaning in the other direction. So this population satisfaction comes out pretty consistently around 25%, with only a 1 with only a 1-2% standard deviation. That means in any of these 50 elections we're simulating, the average population satisfaction with the winner is at most 26 or 27%. 
But perhaps the issue is that the voters don't have enough options to choose from. Let's add in a chunk of code that ignores the previous five determined candidates and randomly generates twice as many candidates as we had before. The distribution of winnings is a bit better, but the overall satisfaction still hasn't budged. Now let's see what happens if we give our voters even more candidates to choose from. With 50 candidates to choose from, there will be a lot greater distribution of leanings and a lot greater distribution of stances. But we still see around a 25-26% satisfaction rating, with again, the highest number of wins going to the candidates with the strongest political leanings, and the folks in the middle taking essentially 0% of the wins. At this point, it's worth tinkering with some of the other parameters in our model to see whether this outcome of 25% satisfaction is a constant or whether it's some fluke in the particular values that we have. So let's try changing the number of issues. Maybe we have too few issues. After all, there's a lot going on in the world that people have opinions over. So let's try increasing the number of issues to 50. Well, it looks like the average stays about the same, with the standard deviation uh, also about the same. What's also interesting is that the graph has become even more tightly clustered. So there's less uh, mediocre satisfaction on each of the ends, and there's less extreme satisfaction in the middle. Okay, but what if we change the number of voters? Let's suppose that we doubled our population in size. Well, it certainly hasn't changed the graphical distribution, and it looks like the average is still around 25%. Now, all of this work has been assuming that our populace is randomly distributed in terms of their political leanings. In other words, our voters are equally likely to choose a leaning anywhere between negative one and positive one. Well, what if we tipped the population in favor of stronger political leanings? So here, for example, the code is going to reselect a leaning if the initial one is between negative 0.5 and 0.5, so that stronger political leanings are going to tend to survive the selection process. Let's see if we push more folks out toward the edges, if that makes us any more satisfied. Well, we can see that there's more dots over on the edges than there is in the middle, so we've had more population go out this way. But there's still this, this V-shaped distribution out on the ends. And we see that our population satisfaction average is still about 26%. Okay, so being stronger in terms of your opinion, in terms of one's opinion doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to produce higher population satisfaction. What if we made the population have weaker leanings? So now we are reselecting if the initial leaning is greater than 0.5 or less than negative 0.5. Okay, so we end up with more dots in the middle than we have at the ends, but again, this is all centered around 0.25, and so our average comes out to be still 25, 26%. So that's a look at the types of parameters we're able to test with our model. And so far, the results look kind of bleak. If we make our population lean more strongly politically, then they just have more opportunities to be dissatisfied. If we make our population more weak politically, then they have more opportunities to be dissatisfied with everybody. So over the next six weeks, we're going to adjust our model to look at different ways the population might approach voting and see if we can increase the satisfaction rating. Next week, for example, we're going to see what happens when we decorrelate some of these issues so that a voter's political leaning is described by more than just a single number. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. It's me again. So after recording and editing and even uploading uh, the first part of this video, I discovered that I had a mistake, uh, but that's okay because science is not about not making mistakes. It's about working in such a way that you can find your mistakes and fix them. Um, here in the match score calculation, you know, the most important line of the code, um, I should be dividing it not by the number of issues, but by the total amount of priority that this candidate has generated. I think in my head, I had already moved ahead to where um, the candidates were, were sort of uh, prioritizing their priorities to where they all added up to 100%. And I will do that in a future video, um, but I have not done that yet. And so what I need to do is I need to divide it by that voter's let's call it total priority, because the priority, you'll recall, is generated as this random number. Let's go back up to the top and find uh, generate issues. So you'll recall that um, 
this priority uh, uh, is generated as a random number between 0 and 1. So that averages out to a half, uh, but there will be some folks with some that are more than a half and some folks with more that are less than a half. Um, and so what that ends up doing is it ends up skewing the results, as we'll see in a second. Um, this is not really going to change too much the distribution of the um, of the of the results, but it is going to change the overall average, as we'll see in just a second. So what we need to do is every time we generate a priority, we need to add it to that voter's total priority. Priority plus equals priority. So what we're doing here is we're adding to the total priority, uh, the priority that was just generated. And so now what I need to do is I need to assign to each voter this value of priority. Oh, actually that should not be um, total priority, should it? Because I don't have, I only have access to the leaning there. So actually, I don't want to do that there. I want to do that down here. Self.total priority equals zero. <clears throat> I already tried this out in another version of the code, uh, but I figured I would uh, uh, show you what it's like to edit a code here on, on this section. Um, so let's see, we want to go through number of issues, number of issues equals zero. Uh, we want while ii is less than or equal to in issues, right? Yes, that's how we, yep, okay, cool. It's the same way I've got it up there. And so then we'll do self dot total priority. Add to that the, let's see here, I want from self dot issue underscore list item ii dot priority. Cool. And then I want ii to increment. <clears throat> and so this should now attach to each voter a value or, or a, a, a variable total priority uh, that starts out at zero and then it adds to it the, um, the, the priority for each issue in the list. Okay, and let's double check here. We've got 10 issues. I think I want to bump this up to 200 voters uh, to make sure that I get a good distribution of it. And so now when it calculates the match score, it'll have the uh, total priority down here which is actually a, a floating point, so I technically don't need this 1.0 in the bottom, but we'll leave it just for safety's sake. All right, did I make any mistakes? I did make a mistake, index out of range. Oh, I probably um, I probably did a less than when I should have done, yeah, I did a less than equal when I should have done a less than, my bad, because Python starts counting at zero. Okay, cool, um, so what you get is a approximately the same distribution, right? So it's still this X-shaped distribution because the folks at the uh, far positive end and the folks at the far negative end are either very satisfied, or either rather satisfied or very dissatisfied. Um, the folks in the middle are all clustering around here, but now the population average is 51. Oh, I think I need to... I need to change that down below as well uh, because I recalculate the match score here. And we'll do that by vote.total underscore priority. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, that's what I was expecting. Yeah. So now, and, and the reason it was bugging me, and I didn't let this show in the video because I was just going to march forward and hopefully find it later, um, is because it's flattening out at zero by symmetry this graph should also be flattening out at one because you should be just as equally likely to find a candidate that is uh, in line with you as you are to find one that's completely out of line with you. Um, and so we've got this, like I said earlier, we've got the same basic shape. We've got the same X pattern, you know, extremely satisfied, extremely dissatisfied, moderately satisfied. Uh, but now it's flattening out at one in addition to flattening out at zero. Um, and the average comes out to be uh, around 50% instead of around 25%. And so basically I was introducing another factor of a half by not dividing by that total weight, uh, which will average out to about, uh, yeah, yeah, that averages out to um, about a half. So it averages out to 
uh, a difference of not multiplying by two, basically. And so our, our candidates can do a little bit better now. They can now reach, you know, 50% instead of 25%. Still not great, but it's it's more along the lines of what you would expect. Um, let's even confirm that that works by switching to our randomized candidates once again. Control. There we go. So now we've got uh, a set of randomized candidates. And this one takes a little bit longer because there are more candidates. All right, and we get the same basic distribution here. Um, not a whole lot of wins going around. It's a little bit better distribution, but again, the lion's share is going to somebody with the strongest leaning to one side or another. Um, it's very difficult for folks with you know a political leaning of a half or even 0.7 to win a significant portion of the of the elections. And again, the average comes out to about 50%. Um, and, our, and I think that's about the same. Yeah, that's about the same standard deviation that we had before. So that's good to know. Um, I will be using that calculation going forward. Thank you for your patience. I know you've been screaming at your computer screen through that error. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.